on Saturday, the 19th, at 9 a.m. at Coyote Joe's. We're going to have breakfast together, so if you can make it, 9.30, come on out to Coyote Joe's. We're buying, so please come. We'd love to have you come. And it would appear that we got a couple birthdays here, so I need to, uh, I need to do that real quick. It looks to me like Lonnie's got a birthday coming up. Hi, Lonnie. Happy birthday. <laughs> Samantha and Adrian, are they in here too? Huh? Brother and sister birthdays. There they are. Um, gosh, how did you guys have birthdays on the same Sunday? Got to hand it to you, Reza. Good timing there, girl. <laughs> oh, there you are. Anyway, let's take a moment and sing happy birthday before we start, shall we? Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, Lonnie, Sam, and Adrian, happy birthday to you. I don't know how we would do that if we had like five of them at the same time. We mentioned them very, very quickly, huh? Please open your Bible to the book of Revelation, chapter 17. We have arrived at a section of our study here where <laughs> think things are going to get kind of strange, you guys. We're in the meat of it. And there's a lot of interesting verses that we're going to read that raise a lot of questions. These verses that uh, a lot of people wrestle with and sometimes don't bother to wrestle with. They just figure it's over our heads and we're not meant to understand it and we'll just not bother with it. But you know, I don't think that that's true. I think that everything that's in the Word of God is meant for us to understand, don't you? And some of the things are hard, and some of them are a little bit complicated. And I know that when we started our study in Revelation, um, I told you that there would be a lot of things that I can't give you an answer to. And I told you that there was a lot of things that we would go through in this book that are, people like to argue over and debate over. And I want to avoid that as much as possible also. But I think as we begin to open up chapter 17 together, we're going to see that things are culminating. Things are building up. I also shared with you how the Holy Spirit instructed John to write down these words. And... How there were times when we got to see view from heaven's perspective, and there were other times when we have a view from the earth's perspective of something that may be going on in the same time period, just different perspective. Sometimes the Holy Spirit led John, as he wrote, to show us these things from a little bit of a distance. We had one of the chapters that we read that pretty much covered um, the second half of the tribulation period. But it was from a distance. And there are other parts. As we go into them, we find that it's basically talking about the same events from a very close, magnified uh, look, if you will. So these next two chapters, chapter 17 and 18 are going to be like a magnifying glass on some of the earlier chapters that we have studied together, including the last one, chapter 16, when they were pouring out the bowls. This morning, we're going to begin to talk about Babylon. You all have heard that name and maybe wonder, what the heck is that? Babylon. Oh, I know. It's a city in the Middle East. Ah, oh, it's a city. Well, it's much more than a city, you guys. We're going to find out that today. 
Babylon is a concept. It's, an, it's, a, it's a way of thinking. It's an ism, if you will. In Revelation chapter 16, verse 19, we saw that the great city was divided into three parts and the cities uh, of the nations fell and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of wine of the fierceness of his wrath. A distance view, if you will, of what's going to happen with Babylon. And even back in chapter 14, we've read about Babylon's fall again from a distance. As we get into chapter 17 and 18, this event will be very carefully detailed. We will get to see every detail of it. Just as a little bit of a background, the word Babylon, the city of Babylon, if you will, just the term itself, we find it 287 times in the Bible. That's amazing. Must be a pretty important word. Must be a pretty important concept for the Holy Spirit to insert it so many times. As a matter of fact, this city is spoken of more times than any other city in the Bible with the exception of Jerusalem. And we're going to see that Jerusalem and Babylon are two opposites of one another. All throughout history, they have been opposites of one another. Jerusalem standing for the true God, the creator of the universe, Jehovah. Babylon, on the other hand, standing for godlessness. Sin. And we're going to see that also. Now, back in the times of the book of Genesis, in chapter 11 is where we first are introduced to the city of Babylon. It was a literal city. It is a literal city on the river Euphrates. And in chapter 11 of Genesis, it tells us that right after the flood that a group of people settled down in this area, which became known, really, as the seat of civilization. It was the culture that would openly express hostility towards God. They expressed hostility towards God in the things that they worshipped, in their idolatry, adultery, fornication, and every manner of horrible, evil sin. No limits to what Babylon would do. It became the capital of a very cruel empire that actually conquered Judah. If you were to speak to the Jews during this time concerning Babylon, they would let you know that to them, Babylon was the essence of all evil. It was, it was the embodiment, if you will, of cruelty. It was the foe of God's people. It is today, too. And it always speaks of sin. It's a type. When we say Babylon, the first thing that comes to our mind is Sin, the practices of sin, carnality, lust, and of course, we don't want to leave out greed. Greed is a very, very important part of all of this. Now, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, we know that the name Babylon, the word itself, is associated with organized idolatry. It's associated with organized persecution of God's people. Now, in John's day, we have to kind of get in our little time machine here a little bit and go back to John's time and the environment that he lived in. And when someone would speak of Babylon as an ism, if you will, they automatically thought of Rome. 
Rome was that place where our God was not allowed. Rome was the place where they worshipped men and false gods. It was a place of no limits, if you will, as far as sin is concerned. And it was also a place of great power, influence, riches, and military power. You know, Rome, when we think of Rome, we might think of Italy and the city in that country. But when the Bible talks about Rome, especially in our text here in Revelation, it's talking about so much more. The provinces of Rome were huge. They just didn't hang out in Rome. They conquered nations one after the other. There was many nations that fell under the iron fist of Rome. It was huge. It represented the world system during John's time. You might want to say, well, gosh, what really was so bad about Rome? Well, you know, I think that maybe, and I don't want to be, you know, too critical, but I think there's a lot of our cities today that we can look at, the behavior there, the mentality in some of these cities today, and we could say, wow, that's a lot like what Rome was like. I'm not going to mention some of the cities, but they exist today. And throughout history, they have existed. But here's the thing. Under the rule of the Antichrist, in both religious and commercial aspects, Babylon will have influence over the whole earth. So in our text this morning, we're going to read about this great harlot Religious Babylon. And truly, that's what Babylon was all about. False religion. Let's read a little ways down through here. In verse 1 of chapter 17, it says, One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abomination and filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. We'll stop there. So John tells us now, and we have seen this several times in our study, where one of these angels, and this one is specified, it's one of the seven angels that had poured out these bold judgments, comes to John. And of course, like I had pointed out earlier in verse 19 of the previous chapter, it kind of puts the fall of Babylon into one verse. But here the angel comes to John and says, hey, come with me and I'm going to show you how this is going to go down. I'm going to show you exactly what's going to happen. I'm going to show you the judgment of this great harlot. <clears throat> now, as a religious system, which is what we're talking about here, 
Um, this was established way before Christianity. Like I said earlier, this goes all the way back to the time right after the flood. And I want to give you just a little bit of interesting information here concerning Mystery Babylon, how it got its name. There is, according to religious history and legend, of course, um, that Babylon was founded by the wife of a man named Nimrod. Nimrod was the great-grandson of Noah. So we see this is right after. And he's married to a woman named Semiramis. Maybe some of you have heard that word before. She was a high priestess of idol worship. And Semiramis gave birth to a son. His name was Tammuz, if I'm pronouncing it properly. She claimed the Tammuz was conceived apart from a man. Does that sound familiar? Kind of like a virgin birth, if you will. Does that sound familiar? So way, way, way back, right after the flood, even back then, the adversary, the devil, Satan, is working to counterfeit what the Messiah would do when he come to earth to save us. From our sins. He was supposedly conceived miraculously. She was worshipped as a goddess. She led them into idol worship. Now just to give you a couple of things that they would do. Of course they would have these great orgies. But here's another thing that they would do that was so horrible in our minds. They would sacrifice their children. They're babies. They would build these statues of metal and build a fire around them and heat them up to where they were glowing hot. It was a statue to Baal, the false god that they worship. And part of their worship was to take their little children and place them in the arms of Baal as they were glowing red hot. And burn them instantly. The Bible says they made their children pass through the fire. These are the kind of abominations that Babylon brought with its inception. And this fellow, Temuz, was considered a savior because he was born of a virgin. Today, there's a lot of artifacts and little carvings of of uh, Semiramis and Tammuz, motifs, I guess they call them. They, they, they show her pictured holding the Savior infant, Tammuz, which, you know, sounds a lot like Christianity in a way. Mocking, imitating, counterfeiting, if you will, what we hold so precious today in our belief Another thing about this fellow Tammuz, it was said concerning him that as he was hunting one day, he was killed by a wild beast. And that he lay dead in the forest for three days. And after three days, he rose from the dead. Oh boy, now it's getting more and more familiar, isn't it? Now we're seeing this counterfeit played out to the max. And just to help us understand what's going on here, this Tammuz guy was supposedly brought to life after he was killed. Now the Canaanite people also worshipped in the same way. And the Canaanite name for Babylon was Baal. That's where we get the name Baal all from, B-A-A-L. Different people pronounce it different ways. I believe it's Baal. Baal is the same 
as Babylon. It's the same as the worship of Tammuz, that false god, that false messiah, the false savior that came into the world so many thousands of years ago. Aren't you glad, looking at that, that God was well aware of what was going on? I mean, think about it. This was after the flood. This was after the cleansing of the planet. And already, men are turning away from God, the creator. Already, men are trying to worship other gods, gods of pleasure, carnal things. And not only that, they're trying to build this tower to heaven to reach the gods. A lot of people think that this tower was intended to get to heaven. But when we look upon this a little bit more, we find out that astrology was really big back in these times too. You know, I know people that you know, in, in my life that I've known who every morning they get up and they read their horoscope. And they plan their day around their horoscope. These people were doing the same thing. They were worshiping the planets and the gods that represented these planets. And if you look at the names of our planets today, you would be shocked to find out that they're all named after false gods. They all originated their names in this religious system. Ezekiel even talks about this in chapter 8, how the women would weep. They would gather together and they would bring gifts to Tammuz or to Baal and weep before him. Jeremiah talks about the heathen practices that they would actually make cakes for Semiramis, who became known as the queen of heaven. And they would bring these cakes as an offering. Jeremiah speaks of it in chapter 44. But here, we see something a little bit different about this Babylonian situation here. Come and I will show you the judgment of this great harlot who sits on many waters. I want you to know this morning this great harlot has been around since the beginning. The great harlot is false religion. The great harlot is in direct opposition to the creator of the universe. And one of the biggest goals of this Babylonianism, if you will, is that in our text, she is presiding, if you will, over many, many nations, many, many people. And that's exactly what it's talking about when it says this harlot sits on many waters. It's talking about people. It's talking about nations, and we'll see that again later. It is a desire to unify all false religion into one. It is a desire to bring in representatives from what we would consider church is, churches, churches, Catholicism, Protestantism, and a smorgasbord of others. The desire is to bring them all under one canopy, if you will. And the Adam tells us that the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk by her. Now, when you think about drunk, you think about reveling and partying and carrying on. When I think about drunk, I think about being under the influence. You know, Jesus, or Paul, in one of his letters, he says, don't be drunk with wine but be filled with the Holy Spirit. What is he telling us? 
Well, some people have latched on to that and said, well, I guess that means when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you act like you're drunk. And you do all kinds of dumb things. And I don't think that's what it's talking about at all. I think what it's talking about is being under the influence of a certain power. Just like you become under the influence of alcohol. It tells us that not only the kings of the earth, but even the people of the earth became drunk with the wine of her fornication. This is a global thing. This is all the civilized nations on the earth that will become drunk with this false religion that will dominate the world during the tribulation period. Now, there are a lot of people who want to identify this harlot with the Catholic Church. And I'm not going to stand here and do that today. But I think what we're going to see is that not only the Catholic Church, but many other so-called Christian churches are also going to be part of this deception. Not just the Catholic Church. Sad thing about it is, though, some of the popes, John Paul II, who met with so many other religious leaders from other religions, their goal, their motive, their intent was to draw together all the religions of the world and become one with one another. That was his agenda. It's history. It's a fact. It's not made up. And it's not the first time that's happened. But this woman who pictures false religion, however that comes together, whatever groups that might incorporate, Hinduism, Islam, Catholicism, Protestantism, whatever, name them all. They're all going to be thrown into a blender and attempted to be brought into one. With one authority ruling it and controlling it. And you might be thinking, gosh, that's a long ways off. How could that really ever happen? Well, I think it's pretty darn close myself. I'm not an alarmist, but I want to be a realist. I'm not here to scare people, but I do want to inform people. False religion is not limited to any one church. Let me just say that, okay? The inhabitants of the earth being made drunk. Karl Marx, I hope you all know who he is. He's the father of Marxism. We hear a lot about that today in our culture. Marxists. He made a comment one time because he was an atheist. He wanted to use this religion mentality as a weapon to control the masses. And this is what he said. Religion is the opiate of the masses. And by getting them addicted to this opiate they can be controlled. Well, I would like to... He was partly right. Truly partly right. But the bottom line on this is that empty religion is the opiate of the masses. We like to say in our church, we're not religious. We're not into religion. We're into relationship. Having a living relationship with our Savior, Jesus. We know that religion is just a dead end road. Trying to keep a religion is like having a ball and chain tied to you. You're dragging it around and it's too weighty for you and me. But really when you get right down to it and you open this up and you look at that word religion... What it really means is something very, very simple. It means to do something consistently. 
that's what it means. The 80-year-old fellow that lives down the street from you who walks his little poodle at 8 a.m. every morning. He does it religiously without fail. He practices it. And that word religion, it can have some good connotations to it. But when you mix that mentality in to our relationship in Christianity, it becomes destructive. Even people that I know who are born again have approached me and said, man, I hope I'm good enough to make it to heaven. I've been trying real hard to be good. I hope when I die that I will have been good enough. That's the spirit of religion, you guys. And I can preach the gospel a little bit right now, and I can tell you, you don't need religion to get to heaven. You need relationship. You need to be born again. You need to be born of the Spirit. You need to walk in the Spirit. You need to break free from that mentality of what the things that I have to do to get to heaven. There's a difference now when the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us. All those have to do's evaporate. You don't have to do anything because Jesus did it all for you already. Is that correct? And when I realize what Jesus has done for me and the power of that and the, the greatness that he would bring me a worm, a sinner, someone who deserves to be separated from him forever and bring me in and make me a child of God because of what Jesus did for me on the cross. My appreciation of that, my being in awe of that, it causes me to want to do those things. I don't have to be here with you this morning. I want to be here with you. You don't have to be here either. I'm really glad you are. But I know that you're here because you want to be here. You're free. You can stay home. You can come. But most of you would say, no, I want to be around God's people. I want to be in there learning God's word. I want to be fellowshipping. I want to be loving one another. That's what I want to do. You see, that's the big difference between being religious and having a personal relationship with the Lord. This religion, this world religion, and you know, Karl Marx was a pretty intelligent fellow. He, he was able to manipulate and still even now manipulating people. Systems. These people are made drunk. You know, this religious system that we're talking about here, evidently the world is going to embrace it. And I want you to know again, as I tell you so many times, that I am certain because of what Scripture tells us, that the bride will already be off this planet at this time. We'll be in the presence of the Lord. You see, we won't be dealing with this at this intense level because we won't be here. Now, will there be people who the Bible and the book of Revelation terms them as saints? Tribulation saints, if you will. Will they be dealing with it? Absolutely. And they'll be martyred. And there'll come a time when they'll be extinguished for a short time. But here's the thing that's so mind-blowing to me. This will be a well 
accepted religious system. People will embrace it. People will say, man, this is what I've been waiting for all my life. This is what I've been searching for. It's attractive. It's spiritual. It's not very moral. Matter of fact, morals, I think that's a word that they've tried to erase from our dictionaries. How much do you hear about that? Not much. When we talk about morals, we know exactly what we're talking about. We know that we're talking about the difference between right and wrong. And it comes from our hearts. I don't believe that there's an individual walking this planet or whoever has walked this planet that doesn't know the difference between right and wrong. I think it's innate in us, in our nature, to know. But since this is a well-accepted religious system, people will actually flock to it. And so he's carried away by the Spirit into the wilderness. I find it interesting that it's happening in the wilderness. Not in a fruitful place. Not in a place of growth, but a desolate place. And John is carried away in the spirit and sees this woman sitting on many waters. And she was also sitting on the scarlet beast, which was full of names and blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now we're starting to get into some of the very, very interesting parts of our study. And that's why I want to take our time to go through. Are you wondering what these seven heads are? Are you wondering what the ten horns are? Are we able to discover what they are through our scriptures? Maybe you're wondering what the beast is. Well, we've met the beast already. We know that this is the Antichrist. We know that the beast will represent a reformed Roman empire. That the same geographical area that Rome occupied 2,000 years ago will be unified together. And this beast is going to rise up out of it. We'll look in Daniel. And we'll see how God explains it to Daniel. Not today, but when we come back together as we're doing the study of these chapters. We'll take a look at that. And there have been those that have said, now, wait a minute. John is saying almost the exact same thing as Daniel said. So how do I know that he just didn't open up the book of Daniel and copy all this stuff into here? Didn't John know the book of Daniel already when this was written? I don't know. Maybe not. You know, they didn't have this back then. They had ancient scrolls. They had the writings of the prophets. But when you think about who John was, John wasn't a Bible scholar. John wasn't a person that you would sit back and look at and say, oh yeah, I'm sure that he studied in depth all the prophetic writings. I don't think that's who John was. John was a Jew. He discovered Jesus at a very early age. He was brought up in Jewish culture, but he wasn't a Pharisee. He wasn't a scribe. He was a fisherman. Go down to Newport to the bay down there and find out how many fishermen are well-versed in prophecy today. That's just not their gig or jig. That just came to me. Isn't that awesome? Thank you, Lord. So to try to use that as a critical statement to come against what we're going to learn about these horns and these heads and these beasts and all that. To me, I look at it from a distance and I say, that's ridiculous to even imply that. This message, these words, this record that we have right here, you know how John got it? 
It tells us. He was carried away by an angel into the wilderness, and the angel showed it to him. And as we go on in our study, we're going to be putting these pieces to the puzzle together from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And we're going to see how awesome and unbelievably incredible the word of prophecy is in the word of God. It's all stitched together perfectly. So that's why I want to kind of cruise as we go through. Give you a little bit of a background this morning on what's going on. This association with the beast, which is clearly political. It's clearly military. It's clearly a strong fist. Oh, I should do the right side. That's what. But isn't it interesting that the harlot is riding the beast. Isn't that interesting? Isn't it interesting that religion, false religion, is playing such an intense role in the activities of the beast? It's interesting that this harlot is going to be blending her religious ideas into the politics of the world. Oh, that could never happen. You know, those are the two things we don't talk about at the dinner table. Religion and politics. But the Bible is going to tell us that these two are going to make a league between one another. We're also going to find out that the beast himself is only using her for his own gain. Because ultimately the Antichrist will rise up out of this reformed Roman Empire, and he will not let anybody worship anybody but him. And so there's going to come a time in our study here where the woman's got to go. Now, I look around today, and I, one of the things I want to be able to try to see as I go through these studies, is there anything today in our culture that would maybe point to the idea that Maybe we're approaching this. I mean, is there any... And I'm not just talking about Oregon. I'm not just talking about our country. We have to view this on a global scale, you guys. Is there something happening globally today that would kind of imply, perhaps, the infancy of what we're reading about right here? Is it possible that this isms that are floating around in our culture right now, that tell you what you can say, what you can't say, how you identify, is there anything connected between those uh, ideologies is a good word for it. It's an idea that people want to throw out on the public, and it almost becomes religious in a sense. Fanatical in a sense. And if you don't line up with it, you're not going to get kicked out of their cult. You're going to be punished by the powers that be, by the government, by the ones that are ruling the world. It's happening right now. Are they after you and me? Uh, Possibly. But you know who I really think they're after? Your kids. You see, Babylon's been going on for thousands of years. Obviously, they're not in a hurry to fulfill their agenda. Obviously, they're willing to wait for just the right time to bring all of this into focus. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to scare you. You know, when I was young and I went to school, and many of you in this room, when you went to school, what was the main goal of your going to school? To learn to read, write, and do arithmetic. And to do a little bit of study about history of our country and even world history. 
But today, in our schools, there's a religion that's being pushed on our children. It's a cult. It's an ism. And it falls right into the plan of this whore of Babylon. And today, if you stand against it, you may be finding yourself in jail. Today, if you stand against it, you may be arrested. So here you have this cult, this fanaticism, ruling our education system, and it's being backed up by the law. Could this be a picture, if you will, a snapshot of what's yet to come? That's not just in our schools, folks. It's all over the world. It's a global phenomenon. It's a global mystery. And that's why she's named Mystery Babylon, because she's not a city. She encompasses all of humanity, the whole world. And there's a lot of ugly, nasty teachings that are out there coming Oh, I have to stop in a minute, but I'm going to say this before I stop. There's some nasty, ugly, false teachings that are coming out of the so-called church that are being laid on people. And because they don't know God's word, because they don't understand God, they're sucking in this junk. Let me give you an example. I just lost my wonderful, beautiful daughter-in-law. Somebody approaches and says, you know, you must be hiding some kind of sin. Otherwise, you wouldn't be sick. Maybe you need to confess that and God will heal you. Did you know that that's a teaching that's floating around out there? And when it hits you personally like that, you think to yourselves, are you kidding me? And here's the interesting thing. This is such a mind blower. So many times those who propose these types of ideas, they, they become sick. They're the ones that become terminal. Things happen to them. And then you have to say, well, what about you? You see, those are lies, you guys. They're lies that are being perpetrated upon us. They condemn you. Jesus doesn't condemn us. Jesus doesn't give you diseases because you're not perfect. Jesus doesn't promise you wealth. This isn't a name it and claim it thing. This isn't a prosperity doctrine. It's a lie. Oh, you just show me one of these men in the New Testament who became rich and wealthy and healthy. Every one of them died a horrible death in poverty, including Jesus. Why am I telling you this this morning? Because as we approach this 17th and 18th chapter, we're going to be talking about false doctrine, false teachings, things that are creeping into the church. And I just pray all of us would understand that these things are not of God. God is merciful. He's good. He's gracious. It's not his will that any should perish. And he's not the big angry man up there with a club just waiting to smash you when you make a mistake. He's the one that has his arms open for you this morning. Maybe you have felt like you have failed him. Maybe you'll look at your life and you'll think, oh my gosh, is this because I'm not perfect? Why don't we have a worship team come on up? I'm going to wrap this up. So this morning, I've kind of wanted to give you just a little bit of a taste of where we're going to be going. Just to whet your appetite, maybe. And we're going to be learning a lot of really, really important things in the next few weeks. 
You might have friends out there that are curious about this type of thing also. And can I just encourage you? Bring them with you to church. Because we're not here to condemn people. We're not here to beat people up. But don't you want to be aware? I do. I think God wants us to be a watchman on the wall for others as well as ourselves. You might need some prayer this morning. Maybe you're kind of wondering about your relationship with Jesus today. And I would encourage you before you leave, maybe meet with Lonnie and Chris over here and pray with them. Let them pray for you. It doesn't matter what your burden might be. But when we have these opportunities, because I know what's going to happen, we're all going to walk out of these doors today. It's Super Bowl Sunday. We're all going to get really busy. Then we're going to be thrown back into the work week. And this idea of coming to grips with my spiritual condition is really easily forgotten very quickly. So perhaps while the Holy Spirit's speaking to you today, you might take advantage of that. Father, I want to thank you for our time this morning. And I, I know that... Uh, uh, I didn't get close to where I wanted to go today, but Lord, I'm trusting that, that, you're, <laughs> that you're speaking. I'm trusting, Lord, that you're guiding us as we go through these very difficult chapters. And I want to thank you, Lord Jesus. And I think all of us would agree, thank you, Lord, for saving us. Thank you, Lord, that we're not going to have the cup of wrath poured out upon us. Thank you, Lord, because of your Holy Spirit, we will not be drunk with the wine of the religions of the world or the politics. And Lord, also, I just want to pray that as we see these things in our lives, in our governments, in our planet, that the peace of God that passes all understanding would rule in our hearts today that we would keep our eyes on the prize fixed upon you, Lord. Even as Peter stood upon those waves, he did it. He stepped out. He was able to stand in the midst of the storm. And we know that he took his eyes off of you and began to sink. Lord, may we learn from that. You're the one that will keep us above the storm, above the waters. You'll never let us go. We thank you for that this morning, and, and we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.
Yes, Mom. 